Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks to all of you for coming to Dubrovnik. Again, I would say, as I told today, I've never seen uh, such a good spirits within a conference we organized. I mean, we had always incredible and very sweet and cute and gentle persons around organizing it, but this was really a standout. So at least for the last three days, we are just laughing here for the out of good spirits and out of uh, <clears throat> great intellectual um, rigor, I would say also. Uh, actually, so Nathan, Nathan in a way mistook or misread what I would design or describe myself today, and today I would say that I have become a former philosopher. And this talk, I mean, it will be a talk, it won't, it won't be a paper, unlike all of you, the other presenters, uh, is a way of, for me to put very personally to, to come with the idea, to come to terms with the idea that I have become a former philosopher. And also maybe it, in a way, also somehow tr to, to be inventive in a way to, to describe to myself and also to the others what does this former philosopher mean. So, uh, that said, as a former philosopher, I would say that unlike a philosopher who is after conceptual and argumentative coherence, a uh, former philosopher is setting up a resonant environment. I would say this is probably would be the most general description. Resonant environment or setting up a display. And a uh, former philosopher's presentation is rather like an introduction to imaginary exhibition that all material displayed is an equal footing and of same importance. This is, let's say, the general proviso of what the former philosopher thinks he has to perform. Uh, and I will immediately unload my, my very first intuition, I would say, rather than a concept. or <coughs> it's intuition in a, in a formula, as you will see in a, in a second. Uh, the concept of form or the idea of form, I was interested foremost time and still interested foremost in the temporality of form. But temporality of form not taken as form's historicity, not taken or not understood as its emergence and decay, but form as inherently temporal operation or I would even say object. Uh, in that meaning Again, not its historicity, not evolutionary or whatever, or genealogical way of thinking about form or forms, uh, but about, let's say, its inherent temporality. So the form of the concept or even a practice of form, or again, as I think, form foremost as a, as a way of operation. And there so come my very basic intuition, that form, is an operation whereby X becomes former X. Uh, or to put it in other words, adjective of form, of the noun form, I claim is not formal, formal, but it is forma. Uh, for example, form of philosophy is form of philosophy is former philosophy or form of any other X is former X. Um, and I hope at least to try <coughs> to set up this display that should resonate what I mean with all of this. As said in other words, <coughs> and also could paraphrase Nietzsche, Nietzsche's Exe Homo. As you know, it is subtitled, How One Becomes What One Is. I would paraphrase it rather like, How One Becomes What one was. In a sense, <clears throat> you'll see, I mean, there's a, at least for me, it seems like very peculiar temporal structure within it, within this phrase or form is an operation whereby X becomes former X. We have the past, present and the future <clears throat> entangled in a rather, again, um, interesting, interesting way. Uh, I maybe also should say that this becoming former. I think it not as becoming 
for example, form is an operation whereby x becomes non-x. I think former x is a more, uh, more radical way of, of um, altering. Even uh, <clears throat> thinking of form as a deformation, like uh, we had also during some of the talks, it was actually also brought up in discussion by, by Nathan. So form as deformation, which probably would be basic uh, Demanian uh, formula. I even think that this becoming form is even more radical than it. Maybe the closest I think uh, we have been in discussion, uh, we had it was a <clears throat> term by Machere, so his term of dislocation that was introduced by Nathan. But the dislocation even made more complicated as I think that this dislocation is probably a temporal one. Okay. Uh, I will proceed by <clears throat> two sets or two um, to uh, different types of examples and uh, meditations. So one one will be uh, so if if I said that f I think I regard form to be a temporal operation object. One way to deal with it <clears throat> will be for me as a former philosopher will be to somehow to to lay out what my philosophical resources would be or what I think temporal op operations within philosophy are, at least those ones that have influenced me to think in, of form in such a way as to be uh, operation of becoming former. So uh, f first part would be within philosophy in three, in three steps, and then uh, for, the other, for the other part, it, somehow to lay out also what I think are temporal operations or object within arts also in three steps, taking literature, uh, film, and, uh, and music. So for the first part, temporal operations and objects within philosophy. Uh, Jacques Rancière's notion of fiction, and I, <clears throat> more specific heterochronic fiction, as Jacques would put it in the last couple of years, I could, within the rubric, I could also put uh, someone like Philippe Lacoula Bart and, and his concept of a fictional typology. Uh, for the sake of, of clarity and uh, brevity, I have just taken up <coughs> Rancière's, Rancière's example. So uh, let's say this would be the first <coughs> kind of temporal operations within philosophy that interest me or guided me in a way. So heterochronic fiction. Uh, that said, Jacques, Jacques Rancière, from his Venice Biennale lecture in 2011, in What Time Do We Live?, he has explicitly developed a new kind of, at least for him, a new kind uh, of um, philosophy of time that he himself mostly, un unlike much of the uh, French theorists still of his age, I mean, as you know, he's turned 70 something. Uh, coming back to, for most of the, as you know, French philosophers and theorists, going back to the canonical uh, Bergsonian uh, uh, thinking of time. Uh, Rancière's uh, philosophy of time in the, since this lecture in 2011 is uh, somehow is, uh, evolved, evolves uh, in contrast, but also supplanting uh, Michel Foucault's notion of heterotopia. And <clears throat> Explicitly, so Rancière introducing heterochronia or heterochrony, which was also a concept in a way, but just in passing, uh, introduced by, by Foucault in his famous text from the late 60s on, the, on other spaces. Uh, it was, in a way, explicit task of Rancière's in the last years to <clears throat> develop for him a thinking or philosophy of time by way of the concept of heterochrony or heterochronia. And Rancière defines <clears throat> at the very start in What Time Do We Live from 2011, his lecture, he says he defines heterochrony as little machines or dispositives that construct other possibilities of looking at the present. Or 
as combinations of times that are normally incompatible. Or again, not just as combinations, but then taking up his, uh, one of his key concepts, I mean, Rancière, he says a heterochron is also a redistribution, so a partage, redistribution of times that invents new capacities of framing and uh, framing a present. So heterochrony, in a way, <coughs> is a new master concept for, for Rancière. So little machines, dispositives, combination, redistribution. But actually what the, 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 the pivotal meaning of heterochrony is, or what this concept, for what kind of experience this concept stands in, is experience, <coughs> which Rancière says in his lecture, is still have not been resolved. So the tension of this experience still have not been resolved. And Rancière says that this is a tension of living in several times at once. So for Rancière, heterochrony is foremost this experience of tension or experience of living in several times at once. And this, as you <coughs> could guess, stand in a contrast to, to, co to uh, in a way, stands in contrast of um, uh, Foucault's heterotopia, uh, where usually, at least, the uh, way it was uh, predominantly uh, interpreted was always just thinking about the other, in spaces, other, uh, in the sense of, uh, as you know, ship, brothel, uh, cemetery, and all those, uh, let's say, marginal spaces of modernity. Usually, so let's say the accent was always in it within the interpretation was put on this other of the spaces, and not so much on the simultaneity of spaces that heterotopia means. So for for Hansier, it is much less again of thinking of those divergent temporal dimensions or temporal slots or whatever we could call them. The for him m much more uh, the stress is on the simultaneity of living in several times at, at once. Uh, so, as so much to, to the concept of heterochronia. And now I come to the, to the concept of uh, fiction that was uh, for the first time uh, introduced. Um, also though, as you know, Rancière is a quite, quite a writer in regard, uh, related to literature and maybe also that said, I would say it was interesting after Nathan's talk on, tu on, on Tuesday that uh, the book he have discussed and that I also uh, hold very dear, so Pierre Macheret's Theory of Literary Production, it's interesting that Macheret since then, if I'm correct to him, I hope I am do justice to him, he has never written anything about literature, so literature from that time on. I would say in a way it's interesting to compare as you know, uh, Macheret and Rancière were in the same seminar of Althusserus to, <clears throat> to compare those two undertakings. <clears throat> Since Macheret has, hasn't produced anything uh, on, on, on literature from, from, from that book in the 60s. So for, for Rancière, if in 2011 in his Venice lecture, heterochrony has, uh, has become a new master concept, in 2017, with the uh, publication of two books, uh, Modern Times in uh, La Borde de la Fiction, in fall of 2017, fiction, it seems, uh, becomes a new, a new uh, master concept for, for, uh, for Rancière. And as you see in a, in a quote, we are used to contrasting fiction, understood as the invention of imaginary beings. So we, we're contrasting it with, with the reality of action a notable of political action that, transformed, that transforms the world. We know, however, since Aristotle, that fiction is much more than the invention of imaginary beings. It is a structure of rationality. It is a mode of presentation which makes things, situations, and events perceptible and intelligible. So what is <coughs> combining now those two terms or those two concepts introduced by, by Rancière of heterochrony and, and fiction I take this somehow to resemble of something that also Nathan in his, in his uh, talk on, on Macheret has, has introduced. So that there is a specific rationality of fiction, again, understood not primarily as invention of imaginary beings, but as a structure of intelligibility. Okay. 
So this was my first philosophical resource. Uh, the second one is a rather small text, which I've been obsessed with. I have been obsessed with this text for about two decades. And it's by major, again, major but marginal uh, philosopher of Frankfurt School of the very first generation, Alfred Zohnretl. <clears throat> And uh, it has been written in 1926. German original title is Das Ideal des Kaputten, or The Ideal of the Broken Down. It is a text about Naples. And it's very, it's very short. I mean, you, you, you can find it online. And just beside also being among the very first, or not maybe the very first, but quite influential, again, is a, some kind of influential, but as an undercurrent for specific philosophy or thinking of technology within the Frankfurt School, I think I take it also as a incredibly well written and uh, very poetic text. So, Alfred Zohn Rittel's short essay on Naples and its uh, relationship towards technology deals with a city grounded upon improbable transformations, misuse, and false appropriations. Be it within the biological, like the St. Patron's li liquidification of blood, be it religious fervor uh, and organized crime, or be it in general things technical, which is Zon Riddle's main field of interest. Altogether, a city, so Naples, more likely not to exist, and subsequently always an astonishment how it persistently survives, though almost everything speaks against its existence. Vesuvo, for example. To quote Zone Rettel, it seems that in Naples, technical devices are, as a rule, broken. It is only under exceptional circumstances and due to some astonishing accident that something will be found to be intact. As time goes by, one begins to have the impression that everything is already broken before it leaves the factory. So this is this <laughs> built-in obsolescence. This impression is valid for the entire realm of technology, but in his brief essay, Zon Riddle will distinguish a three, three different domains of things technical and their respective usage. The first domain is that of technology that is just ornamental, a mere and useless accessory. To quote, what we, are, what we are not talking about, so this is the first dimension of technology in Naples or Mediterranean, what we are not talking about are the door handles, which in Naples appear to be among the mythical entities and are only fixed to doors for symbolic purposes, <laughs> which is because the doors of the city are only there to be left open and, and when they are slammed and when, and when they are slammed shut by the current of a draft, to once again open with the horrified shrieking and shaking throughout their entire bodies. Naples with closed doors that would be like Berlin without roofs on the houses. So this is the first domain of the technological. In contrast to the first one, the second domain is not just ornamental and superfluous, but properly speaking, supernatural. Again, Zon Rittel. On the other hand, real danger is posed by elements such as electricity, which are apparently indestructible and which always leave one wondering if they are even of this world. Of course, Naples, Naples has its own very special place for this phenomenon. Such inscrutable spiritual beings as these flow together uninhibited with the nimbus of the religious powers and the festive Osram light bulb is united in Neapolitan saintly images with the Madonna's aureole. Nor is there any explanation for the Iron Law, according to which every club, couple of days or so, the trams come to a standstill due to a power cut. La corrente non c'è, so the power is out, is the simple phrase usually preferred to explain this divine intervention. It is possible that the telephone would work very well indeed if the numbers did not go their own way and the official phone book, or at least telephone inquiries, could somehow be let in on the secret of these numbers. Well, whatever the details of the meta might be, in Naples, all this no longer belongs to the realm of the purely technical. So this would be the second domain of the things technical in Naples. And the third, so, but it, it is the third domain of the things technical that draws most of Zon Rittel's attention. 
a domain of what he calls truly mechanical devices. It is here that the decisive Neapolitan twist concerning technology happens. And it is here within the mechanical machinery that Zon Rettles postulates his central argument. Quote, I quote, not, however, that they, mechanical devices, are broken because they do not work. For the, Neap uh, for the Neapolitan, it is only when things are broken that they begin to work. <laughs> or to quote, what is conceived as technical is that which really begins when man makes use of his veto against the closed and hostile automatism of machines and plunges himself into the world. <laughs> and when he does, he proves to be leaps and bounds ahead of technical laws. For he does not take control of the machines by studying the manuals and learning how to use them, but by discovering his own body inside the machine. And now <clears throat> for the last quote of Zon Rettel, so with <clears throat> bearing in mind this body which, human body which uh, plunges inside the machine, again a quote from Zon Rettel, with hair rising there, so man, he races around in his car, and if this recklessness does not result in something being smashed up, a wall along the side of the street, or a donkey cart, or even his own car, that it has all been, uh, that it has all been a wasted waste of time, so, if, so this, is, this should be the result, so been a waste of time. One never really owns something until it has really been knocked, been knocked around, otherwise it is just not worth it. It has to be used and abused, run down until there's practically nothing left of it. So this was my second philosophical resource, so the built-in obsolescence by, as described by, by and now the third philosophical resource had <clears throat> probably now for the last couple of years have been major interest for my own uh, research. This is a uh, French uh, philosopher and art historian Georges Didier Berman and, uh, and coming to resonate, we have been talking a bit after today's uh, per uh, per Pearls and, and uh, Philippos uh, paper, just a bit about, about Dieberman and uh, his, uh, his Warburgian attachments. So, so that's say, I would say that if there is, a, in a way, a successor here to Abi Warburg today, and now uh, he gets more prominent almost by day, since it was for a decade or so that, at least in English uh, <coughs> language uh, um, countries, Almost no other, no new books or no recent books of Didier Berman have been translated. Now, just within the period of a couple of months, three have been, have been, and still some, some to come. Uh, most importantly, his uh, <coughs> book on Abi Warburg. So the concept of survival, um, which interests me uh, as a temporal operation or te temporal object, uh, this is something that Didier Berman owes great length uh, to, to Abi Warburg and his concepts in German both of Nachleben, so living on and Überleben, survival or surviving. So uh, Rancière was fiction, Zon Riddle was built in obsolescence and for Didier Bergman I would take his concept of survival. And there I'm not so much following his, his, uh, his major writings which are at least since 2000, he's quite prolific. I mean, even I would say not even Jean-Luc Nancy would be as prolific as, uh, or is as, that pro as prolific as Didier Bergman is, so it's at least two or three volumes in French published each year. Uh, I think uh, there are some of his uh, shorter uh, texts, like uh, most notably his text on Pasolini and uh, Emergence of Fascism, from 2009, which is called The Survival of the Fireflies, or a book which just in uh, fall of 2017 finally was published uh, by, in English by MIT, Bark Ecors, or even a small, a small, very small uh, book or publication, actually an open letter to Hungarian director Laszlo Nemes, Sochtyr uh, from 2015, so Leaving the Dark. What has interest me in those uh, 
in those short type applications of Didier Bergman is unlike in those major volumes where he had really in a way projected incredible uh, <coughs> structure of thinking or new kind of art history taking together Warburg, uh, Benjamin uh, and much of the um, artistic and cinematic production of the last century so it's and this whole series is called um, the eye in history so it's not uh, eye like the prana uh, uh, the uh, but eye like the eye of the eyesight so it's now already comprises six volumes and now just the f second one has been uh, out of the six volumes has been published in english the eye in history uh, that unlike in those volumes where he is in a way very, I mean, he's almost uh, so much of the text, textual material that you would have a sense that he goes very safe and still that there is a, in a comfort zone. Unlike in, so in, in those bigger volumes, major volumes, in those shorter ones, he in a way speculates. And this is what actually I would say is uh, most interesting for me uh, in regard to him. And so this speculation led him, again, to propose a specific kind of new kind of objecthood uh, that would stem in a way from those major theoretical um, uh, propositions he has done. So for example, uh, one would be uh, the tininess of, of, of a object or operation, tininess in a way standing for or being a metaphor for the Indestructible, indestructibility of experience. For example, against Agamben, as you will know, one of the <clears throat> very first Agamben volumes in 1977, uh, Infancy and, and Experience, or uh, Infancy and uh, History, Agamben claimed in, um, in a Benjaminian way that modernity is, uh, is characterized by the loss of experience. And there, <clears throat> Didier Bergman is quite on the contrary, everything he tries, especially in the volume on the fire, fireflies, to show <clears throat> in what kind of catastrophism such an intellectual suggestion or proposition that modernity means annulling, annihilating experience as such, which, uh, let's, let's say what kind of political impasse, especially in fighting uh, fascism, could lead. Uh, so let's say, for example, so tininess or indestructibility of experience, or second feature of object or operation for the Bergman, and uh, this is a quote from uh, Bark. So this is a book about uh, concentration camp of Birkenau, so Auschwitz Birkenau. Uh, second feature, for example, uh, would be. And let's say this is almost comprising all of uh, the Bergman's uh, theorization. And I quote now, we can therefore never say there's nothing to see, there's no more to see. To be able to doubt what we see, we must know, uh, know, how, uh, uh, know how to keep looking, how to see in spite of everything, despite the destruction, the erasure of all things. We must know how to look as an archaeologist looks. And it's by way of such a gaze, such an interrogation directed toward what we see, that things begin to look at us from their concealed spaces and bygone time. So the, what I find here yeah, in, in really incredibly uh, inspirating, uh, in, inspirative and maybe not with some resonances to object-oriented philosophies of the last decade, would be uh, this proposition by, and this is also one of titles of uh, some uh, more uh, uh, of, 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 of another major uh, uh, publication by Didier Mann from still from the 90s. So the title of that publication and the <clears throat> that the things we look at, they they return the gaze. So they begin to look at us. So this proposition that. <clears throat> object that start at some point to look at us. Again, this is, uh, I mean, it could resonate at least within the intellectual uh, sphere we are now um, part of as a, some kind of object-oriented thing, but I would claim, I mean, 
I don't have, of course, the time here to do it, that this is something else. I mean, that this proposition that at some point, due to our keen, meticulous, uh, constant, concentrated looking upon things, gazing up, watching them, that at some point, this act of concentrated looking, at some point, uh, it provokes things, objects, to look back at us. And I would call this intelligent as a, as a feature of, of object objecthood proposed by by, by the Dudeman. So let's say those were three philosophical resources I, I, so I had in mind. So it's um, fiction, heterochronic fiction by Hansier, built-in obsolescence uh, by by Rittel and uh, Zon Rittel and survival. Again, as a very specific uh, operation by by, by Didier uh, Berman, and I will turn to the to the uh, to the second set of, of of examples, and those are those within within arts. And I will first <coughs> mention two two writers and literature as the as a field of inquiry. Both Hungarian, Imre Kertes, the, the late Nobel Prize winner from 2002, and Laszlo Krasnohorkai. Uh, and very specific inquiry, or almost, you could say, almost a philosophical project, Kertes has, in a way, set up. And Krasnohorkai, in a way, has followed, especially since Kertes' uh, <coughs> uh, illness. He was Parkinson. And um, the, the moment he died a couple of years ago. Uh, as you probably recall, the, the major, major novel written by, by Imre Kertes, and that in a way granted him or the Nobel Prize, was already written some 20 years before it was published first time in, in Hungary, Fateless or Fatelessness, so there are two English translations. It was published 1975 in Hungarian, but it was written almost two decades <coughs> in advance. Uh, to the last proper novel Kertes has published in 2003, and I take it real to be significant, this was a novel published just after he got the Nobel Prize, Liquidation, so this is the novel from 2003, which I take to be the pinnacle and real the, the masterpiece of, of his oeuvre. Um, there was, a, I mean, if there was a author philosophical, a writer philosophical uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, always in a tacit or many times explicit dialogue with such names and references from Wittgenstein, Bernhard, and many others, it was uh, it was Imre Kertes who also was. Uh, for some of those German-speaking authors, he was also the Hungarian translator. So, but this is one specific short story, which is uh, which I take in a way to be the the most concise, or in a way the most programmatic piece he has ever written. And this is a piece from 1991. It was translated some six, seven years ago in English. It's called the Union Jack. And it is uh, the Union Jack as the English flag. Just to say very short, it's, uh, it's a short story about 1956 revolution in Hungary and Budapest. And there is an epiphan epiphantic moment where Union Jack on a jeep somehow comes about in the streets of Budapest. And this serves, let's say, as a grand metaphor for for revolutionaries of Hungary of '56, been left alone or being deceived by the by the by the West before the Russians intruded. Uh, within so those this story, and now I come to the philosophical inquiry, almost quasi philosophic inquiry of Imre Kertes. He was obsessed, let's say, from faithlessness to liquidation, somehow to come up with the formulation, with the perfect or decisive formulation. And I, and I take this formulation to be also resonant or echo of form. So formulation. So maybe formulation is a, a, some kind of radicalized form. 
in language or in writing. And there in Union Jack, <coughs> uh, I will read out a bit more out of it than uh, it's here on the screen. The narrator says, and on one or two occasions I was even introduced to Erno Sepp, purely for the sake of being able to hear him introduce himself with the phrase that has since attained legendary, nigh mythical status. I was Erno Sepp. Of course, I said, you would have had to see Erno Sepp. You would have had to see the old chap who, before you would have, have been able to see him, was Erno Sepp. A tiny old chap who seemed to be relieved of his own very weight, swept along the icy streets like a speck of dust by the wind of disaster, drifting from one coffee house to the next. You would have had to see his neat, hopeless gray suit, the trouser legs begging on to his shoes. Even then I suspected, but now I know for certain, that this introduction, I was Erno Sepp, was not one of those habitual disaster jokes or disaster witticisms of this disaster city, Budapest, which, in the disaster era that had by then undisguisedly set in, were generally believed and accepted, because people could not believe, because they did not know or want to believe or want to give credence to anything else. And then, no, that introductory form was a formulation, and a radical formulation at that, a heroic feat of formulation, I would say. Through this formulation, Erno Sepp remained, indeed became the essence of Erno Sepp, and at the very time when he already only was Erno Sepp. A formulation which lures nobody towards anything, but with which nobody can ever be reconciled, and by that token, a formulation with a far-reaching resonance. So, as you could guess, I mean, I would, I would now dare a, a big, let's say, comparison that this formulation of I was Erno Sepp <coughs> almost amounts to a status of Melville's, uh, Melville's Bartleby. I prefer not to, as a, really <coughs> as a new way of, let's say, existential formula even more. Uh, and, okay, so it's, let's say, uh, and this was, if I would say, major uh, inspiration for me uh, to come to think about something becoming former. So this formula, I was Erno Sepp. Uh, Laszlo Karasno Horkai, he has, uh, he has taken up this, not explicitly, but as a way of uh, friendly resonance, he has taken up this formula, I was Erno Sepp, in a small and uh, within the Krasnohorka over a decisive short story published in 2009, El Ultimo Lobo, The Last Wolf, where a character figured in a short story is a philosopher or character calling himself a former philosopher living in Berlin who gets invited for residency to Spain and Stramadura and who therefore month tries somehow to produce something out of whatever. And he is not able to, not able to produce anything. But it, was, it is interesting, and I would say, I mean, if you would like to, uh, let's say, have Krasnohorkai 101, Last Wolf would be for sure the, 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 the best introduction to, to his oeuvre. It is, again, <coughs> what I think uh, is important within, within this, let's say, if there is an evolution or literary evolution, that uh, Krasnohorka has, has taken up this formulation of Kertes's I was Erno Sepp, making Erno Sepp, who was actually a real figure of Hungarian culture of the 20th century, who was a writer and a journalist, uh, unlike with Kertes, who makes a character. So Erno Sepp is a character within the story, the Union Jack of Rime Kertes. But Krasnohorka makes it even, uh, let's say he makes even it more complicated, making the figure of almost despairing size or he, make, he makes this character a philosopher or more, he makes him a former philosopher. And again, I was struck what this, this former philosopher could mean 
but again, uh, let's say this would be just a content, content-wise uh, dealing with, with those two writers. Form-wise, <coughs> still uh, Imre Kertes, <coughs> still his his novels are almost canonical, almost conservative, or classically uh, built or constructed. For uh, what I think is even more important in uh, in Kasan Horkai, let's say regarding in this kind of a <coughs> line of development, would be that Laszlo, that this idea that form, and now taking it in a formal manner, that form in a way not just deforms but also somehow deforms or breaks out of a point something to something else that his own writing, especially since The Last Fall, which is, as you maybe will recall, is a short story of some 40 pages, that this is a short story of just one sentence. And that since then, Krasnohokai has uh, begun not just to experiment within literary genres with long sentences, which, for example, probably the volume uh, Say or Bo Down Below would be the, the paradigm case, and I would argue the most important uh, Krasnohorkai book until now, but also within some smaller, let's say, some smaller um, uh, uh, or, or other genres, like, for example, the book which is called Animal Inside, <coughs> or some, also some other forthcoming texts. And then, maybe what, what I would say is, is, is interesting, and that this still gives me somehow to think of, is that uh, while in Kertes, the, the disaster, in a way, so the for radical formulation, I was Erna Sepp, is somehow coded within a bigger or general disaster, which we could think of historically as being a Holocaust, being a, a, corrup a corruption of a, of a socialist state, or even as in his novel, Liquidation, even corruption of a post-socialist state be it Hungary or whatever, that for, uh, so that this discourse on disaster, while in Kertes we still have the allure that this is uh, something very real or something very historical in the sense of very clearly left referenced disasters of, within history and of history, that unlike with, with Kertes in Krasnohorkai, there's a, a general, almost ontological, uh, definition of, of disaster or somehow striving to give account ontological or cosmological definition of devastation. And it was in, a, in, the, in the last book published so far by, by Krasnohorka in, in English, The Manhattan Project, which is Krasnohorka's diary of his residence in New York 2016, that at some point Krasnohorka muses with the possibility, again inspired by, by, by his walking around Manhattan and in a way, search, searching the, the, the locations of Melville's uh, uh, life on, the, on, the, on, the, on Manhattan, that the Kasten Horkheim muses at some point that he could write a book which would be entitled Back to Earth, a new definition of devastation. So for him, I would say, so this would be in a way my, 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 uh, my claim for, for Kasten Horkheim. I find it incredibly interesting that this formula, as it was put by by Kertes, I was an asset, existential up to a point to being a, that one can compare it to to to, to Melville or Nietzsche. That uh, Kasten Horkai tries to to expand it both in a in a way in a content con content wise, but also in a in a formal way of experimenting with with forms which at some point can get, let's say, sentences of 40 or 50 pages long, at some point almost gets kind of prose poem. Okay, so now I come to the, to the, to the uh, second domain, this would be film. Deimantas Narkevicius is an incredibly Lithuanian artist, probably among the very most important Eastern European artist or European artist of today. And um, what we'll now see uh, is a film <clears throat> just 
premiered Dust and Scratches. In regards to a film and to the, to the question of obsolescence or anachronism or of this formula, form is that operation that makes thing, that makes thing, things or axes becoming former axes. I would say that, I mean, within, within this discourse on cinema, at least since the, or maybe one could say since the inception of cinema, like Louis Lumiere, a famous quote from him that cinema is an invention without future, <laughs> that one could say that at least from a <clears throat> experimental practices of a new American cinema, uh, an experimental, so from the 60s, that uh, obsolescence or anachronism belongs to a very uh, discourse on, on cinema. And probably the most important case for it would be essay by Hollis Frampton from uh, 1971, rather short essay, incredibly funny, uh, which is entitled for Meta History of Film. Where Hollis Frampton claims that no activity can become art until its proper epoch has ended and it has dwindled as an aid to gut survival into total obsolescence. To be more precise, I quote again Holmes Fenton, the notion that there was some exact instant in which the tables turned and cinema passed into obsolescence and thereby into art is an appealing fiction that implies a special task for the meta-historian of cinema. So actually what I'm interested in is that exactly is a claim that Art, to become art, means you have to become obsolescent. Uh, that said, now we'll watch for about eight minutes, which movie, which is uh, in this form, on this format we will see it, is uh, not all, or is uh, non-integral, since this movie, so Dust and Scratches by, by, by Deimantas Narkevicius, is 3D. So one layer, which unfortunately we won't see, is the layer, but you will be able to discern it. There is a layer which is uh, then made up 3D, where you would have a 3D impression of, on your glasses, 3D glasses, of dust and scratches. For the, for the other, let's say, screen, which is 2D in a way, uh, this is a film, this is a material found footage of... Uh, of a somewhat illegal underground performance of Jesus Christ Superstar, so the rock opera or musical, in 1971 in Vilnius in Soviet Union. So it's, I mean, it has, let's say, I mean, we could go on with thinking about all those references, so Jesus Christ Superstar and Soviet Union, but what I found so attractive about this movie, and something so grandiose in a way, is that the author uses a new technology, 3D, or rather new technology, which also in some way is, is a non-starter, almost seems like is obsolete from the very start on, it has been introduced, somehow to render found footage, uh, cinematic found footage, and just to tell you that the context of, uh, probably of some of you are familiar with the experimental cinema, or the developments within it, currents within it, there's an incredible <coughs> surge of fetishism of found footage of 16, 8 millimeter, whatever, films or celluloid, just in the very moment digital has become so uh, pervasive. So I, I think this movie, in a way, if I would try to think of metaphor for what I'm trying to, to, to get to is, uh, so this is the piece. And just eight minutes long, so bear with me. Uh, I should most have to. Uh, just a moment. Uh, no.
So, this was the Imantes Narkevichius. Again, if you will be able to, to see it in 3D, I highly recommend. Amazing artist, uh, not just as a, as a film director. Uh, almost, coming, almost coming to my end. Will be third, third domain I'll um, say something about is uh, music, and uh, another another way of saying that form is operation making X's former X's. Third templates. Third templates is a at least since mid nineties one of the most prominent experimental electronica artists around. A transgender person, which makes his, uh, is uh, especially significant for his music, uh, m creative uh, music production. And uh, also, in a way, a philosopher. Like the moment Na uh, Michael was uh, <clears throat> talking about Alice's Coltrane, Coltrane's liner notes, I've amused a bit about it, or at least I said, I mean, how embarrassing some, at least some of her liner notes are. I will put myself on the same, let's say, on the same level, uh, quoting some of the um, liner notes of 2017 recording put up, put out by, by Ter Temlitz. Uh, Deep Production. Deep Production is the name of a project which was also uh, prominently featured at the last year's Documenta exhibition. So deep production and liner notes are, if for Ellis Cotrain it was just maybe a page long, for Ter Temlitz it is, the, the liner notes are much, 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 much longer. And um, I just will read out the first couple of sentences for the liner notes of a piece, we'll just now in a minute, we will hear parts of it. The piece is called Admit It's Killing You and Leave which uh, their templates subtitles sound slash reading for gay porn. So I quote their templates. There isn't much time. So, there isn't much time. We have to skip the foreplay. For some of you, this will require suspensions of disbelief. But please open yourself to the following two premises. First, having children is unethical. Second, families make democracy impossible. And now, so the line now is going then for, for, for pages. Uh, third template, I mean, we could situate him with a very specific, not Afro-pessimist uh, trajectory, but for sure with any trajectory sketched out by, by someone like Lee Edelman and his concept of no future or someone like Paul B. Preciado, another transgender person, quite important uh, theorist, I, I claim. Uh, and uh, much, of, much of this piece, so Ted Temelitz's deep production is, uh, is also in a way referencing those two intellectuals. Piece itself is, uh, consists of a couple of pieces or compositions or uh, and also there's a video to it, so uh, I, won't, I won't play the video, so it, which is uh, fairly interesting. It is kind of remix of Japanese porn, even some is incest porn, so as to, let's say, supplant is a very programmatic uh, liner notes, so families make democracy impossible. Uh, I'll just play, maybe as a just, and I will have my point then about the obsolescence of some of the music you'll listen to. So I, I guess maybe we'll just listen for a couple of minutes for <clears throat> first piece and then a couple of minutes of, this, of the second one, the remix. So now we'll just listen for two or three minutes to a piece called Admit It's Killing You and Leave, sound reading for gay porn.
excuse me. They're very pro-traditional men. Which is under attack. By gay people just being around. So this was the, let's say, the original piece, Admit It's Killing You and Leave. Those preluding on the piano, and there's also, as you see, there's also piano solos extracting, so just the uh, uh, piano of, uh, uh, <clears throat> without any arrangement. Uh, and now, for the remix, DJ Prinkles was also Terry Temlitz. Uh, to say, like in the liner notes of the of the project, it's not just about no future attitude, so that having children is unethical and families make democracy impossible, but it is also for trans or gay person like Ter Temlitz is, there's some vantage point in a, <clears throat> at least a traumatizing point or disastrous point. It would be the <clears throat> emergence of HIV AIDS early 80s, and um, within a very specific musical culture we are living in, <clears throat> maybe even with just with those two minutes we have listened in, uh, you could guess that there would be some reference, uh, resonances to someone like Arthur Russell, the late Arthur Russell, or the late Julius Eastman, who has been now in a way just in a way rediscovered as a, as, as a major reference <clears throat> within the post-minimalist music. Been also uh, gay, or as you maybe will know, there's an even programmatic piece by, 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 by Julius Eastman, Gay Nigger. Um, so the second piece, in a way, is, will make this anachrony or this obsolescence uh, will return to the very moment uh, where <clears throat> Deep House, at least for some of the New York uh, uh, <clears throat> quarters or uh, let's say uh, clubs, it was invented, I mean, almost less simultaneously with the, with the advent of HIV. And I mean, since I would just let those two minutes play, I mean, the, my, 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 let's say, the, the, the last thing I present, telling maybe just to, 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 to make my point again. What I think is, is interesting in the claim that form is an operation whereby some X becomes former X, it's almost, first of all, the disjunction of form and anything else. Let's say form and content form a matter. So to, to be, in a way, there, or to think of form as disjunctive or heterogeneous, temporarily heterogeneous to any kind of content and form, and that each form or each type of form is always a form of something that is former. It is already made obsolete or anachronous by, by form, by the process of informing. 
and this I take, let's say, uh, as, a, as a point of my presentation. So, now, those Lithuanian people in Vilnius of 1971, they danced to Jesus Christ Superstar. If you feel free to dance to admit, admit it's killing you and leave by DJ Sprinkles Deep House mix. This would be it.